Amen. So Hosea chapter number 8, we're starting a new chapter tonight. So in Hosea chapter number 8, we're going to get a few verses in here, but we've got more rebuke uh, from Hosea, from the Word of God, um, to the nation of Israel. Let's look down, of course, Hosea, a prophet to the northern kingdom of Israel, and he's rebuking both uh, mainly the northern kingdom of Israel, but he's throwing Judah in there every now and then because they got mixed up with the northern kingdom of Israel, who went into wickedness almost immediately at the split when Jeroboam and Rehoboam um, split the kingdom um, back, uh, Solomon's son Rehoboam, and then Jeroboam took the northern kingdom. The northern kingdom went bad right away. They set up the two golden calves in uh, Samaria and Bethel, uh, yeah, Samaria and Bethel, and um, you see one of those golden calves brought up um, this evening, and in this chapter, Um, That's one of the reasons that uh, God is rebuking them here. Hosea is rebuking them. Look at verse number one of Hosea chapter number eight, and let's get into it tonight. The Bible says, set the trumpet to thy mouth. He shall come as an eagle against the house of the Lord because they have transgressed my covenant and trespassed against my law. Israel shall cry unto me, my God, we know thee. Israel has cast off the thing, verse three, that is good. The enemy shall pursue him. Now it's talking about the things that are going to happen to Israel because they've transgressed the covenant of God and trespassed against his law. So obviously they did not follow the Bible. They did not follow the word of the Lord. They went into idolatry. They went into wickedness. They turned their back on God. And now we're going to see the results. Um, the, you know, this is coming back upon them. Look at verse number four. They have set up kings, but not by me. They have made princes, and I knew it not. Of their silver and their gold have they made them idols, that they may be cut off. Thy calf, O Samaria, hast thou cast thee off. Mine anger is kindled against them. How long will it be ere they attain to innocency? So they're not even knowing that they did anything wrong here. So they've set up these golden calves. And, of course, Jeroboam did that back at the beginning of the kingdom because he was worried that he would lose people to Judah, that people would go to Jerusalem to worship the one true God, and he would much rather just go into idolatry and go into heresy than lose his kingdom, all right? He was very, um, I guess what you would say, and we're going to talk about it tonight a little bit, he was a very self-willed person. He was a self-willed ruler where he was just wanting to do whatever it took to keep the people in uh, the northern kingdom of Israel and not have them go back to Judah. Look at verse number six. For from Israel was also the workmen made it, therefore it is not God. Talking about these calves. But the calf of Samaria shall be broken in pieces. So this idol is just going to be destroyed, is what the Bible is saying. Now look at verse number 7, and this is where we're going to focus this evening. This is a very famous verse in the Bible, Hosea 8, 7. Now um, God says this, he says, For they have sown the wind, and they shall reap the whirlwind. It hath no stock. The bud shall yield no meal. If, it, if so be it yield, the strangers shall swallow it up. And we're going to look at the first part of this verse here where the Bible says, For they, talking about the northern kingdom of Israel here, they have sown the wind and they shall reap the whirlwind, meaning these consequences that are coming back. They went into idolatry. They went into all this wickedness. They turned their back on God and they're going to reap the consequences of that. So what I want to talk about tonight is this concept in the Bible of sowing and reaping, sowing and reaping. So first of all, in the Bible, the first thing that we need to see tonight is that sowing and reaping is all over the Bible, all right? It is all over the Bible, and it is a law. It's a law in the Bible. It's both a law that applies to the natural world, and it's also a law that applies to the spiritual world. Now, what do I mean by it being a law, all right? So a law is, uh, let me give you some examples of laws. Like if you've heard of Newton's laws of motion, you know, there's three laws of motion, right? I mean, who knows the laws of motion? They were in the 17th century, the laws of motion. The first one is that it's the law of inertia, right? That an object in motion tends to stay in motion. Meaning if, you know, you throw a ball or there's something that's moving, unless some other force acts upon it, it's gonna stay in motion. Another part of that, the other part of that law is that an object at rest tends to stay at rest, meaning a ball or something sitting on the ground or anything, this pulpit, whatever, that chair, it it will stay at rest unless some force 
you know, is applied upon it that moves it off its rest. The second law of motion is force equals mass times acceleration. It's basically just an equation showing uh, that, you know, the, the respect of, you know, mass and acceleration, you know, a force upon an object and how fast it will get that object moving. You can calculate it using that relationship. And then the third one is every, every action, you know, there's an equal and opposite reaction, right? When you throw, and, and this is not quite intuitive, but it's interesting when you think about it, when you throw a basketball onto the ground and it bounces back up, you know, that basketball might be hitting the ground with a force of five pounds, but the, the reason it bounces back up is because the ground is actually pushing five pounds back at the ball. All right, so these are laws. All the point is this, and the laws of thermodynamics are the same. I won't explain all those to you. I love those two, but those were, you know, much later, the late 19th century into the early 20th century. We ended up with the three, uh, three laws of thermodynamics. But the point is these are laws. And what does that mean? Laws mean are different from theories because laws, it's that's how it works. All right, that's how it's going to work every time. It's going to work that way given the same environment, given the same conditions, the same variables. It's going to work that way every single time. That's why it's laws of motion, laws of thermodynamics. Theories in, in science and things like that, theories are, are things people come up with to explain the laws, to explain why the laws work that way. All right, and some theories may be correct, some theories may not be correct. But laws are how things work. All that to say that, okay? Laws are it works this way for sure. And this idea of sowing and reaping is a law in the Bible, all right? It's a natural law uh, in the physical world. And I'm going to show you that the Bible also talks about it being a spiritual law as well. And it's a spiritual law that applies to everybody. So much so that even people that are not Bible-believing Christians have noticed this law and they've named it different things. They've noticed it in different religions. They've noticed that just it seems to work this way. All right. Let me give you an example here. All right. Turn to Genesis chapter number one. Let's look at sowing and reaping just in the physical world around us, just in the natural world around us. Turn to Genesis chapter number one and look at verse number 28. Genesis chapter one and verse number 28. So we're exploring this idea in the Bible of sowing and reaping. All right. But let's look at just some physical um, aspects of sowing and re reaping. Look at verse number 28 of Genesis chapter 1, right after the creation here, it says, And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply. He's talking to um, the people here. He's talking to Adam and Eve. And replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. So God is saying, Go multiply, replenish the earth. And God said, Behold, I've given you every herb-bearing seed, which is upon the face of the earth, and every tree, which is the fruit of the tree, yielding seed, and to you it shall be for meat. So everything in the physical world works this way, from people to animals to plants. As a matter of fact, I mean, it all works this way where you sow or, you know, two people come together and have children, animals procreate and have, you know, multiple different um, animals, and they, they just, they procreate and they, you know, make, they multiply, they make more than what started in the beginning. In, in the plant world, the agriculture world, it's you plant one seed and you get many seeds. You don't just get one seed back for a seed planted. I remember back before, you know, GMOs, what you would actually do when you were farming is you would keep back 10% of your crop to use as seed for the next year. Now you go to Monsanto and you just buy the, you know, the whatever they've created, right? And then you plant that. But the seed procreates itself. Have you ever heard the idea of heirloom seeds? This is just natural seeds that when planted, they will produce a plant that also has natural seeds. Those seeds can be taken and planted and they will produce another plant that makes natural seeds. One interesting thing, now this has nothing to do with the sermon, but one interesting thing about GMOs is you cannot do that with GMO seeds. GMO seeds are meant to plant once and have one crop. You cannot take 10% of the GMO crop and replant it because it will, the yield will just, the curve just drops off a cliff. Why is this? Because they want you to keep coming back and repurchasing the, the new seeds for next year. It's, a, it's basically a business decision. So when you hear people talking about heirloom seeds, they're basically just talking about the seeds that God created. 
the seeds as God made them that will produce more seeds and just multiply, basically sowing and reaping in the physical world. All right, turn to Matthew chapter number 13 now. Turn to Matthew chapter number 13. So there's a translation now of the physical world to spiritual world with this law of sowing and reaping. And this is important that we know this as Christians. It's important, it's important that everybody would know this, but you know, we're the ones that believe the Word of God, so we're the ones. This is an advantage. Tonight, this is a sermon tonight that you have an advantage in life knowing what the Bible says about this because it's going to work this way for everybody. All right, look at Matthew 13, verse 31. The Bible says, Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like to a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all seeds. But when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs, and becometh a tree, so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. Now turn to Galatians chapter number 6. So sowing and reaping seeds, this mustard seed grows into this great tree that has, you know, many more seeds in it is another physical example of this. But you see Jesus using this as an example of, you know, the spiritual word of God being sown um, in the earth. All right. Look at Galatians chapter number six and look at verse number seven. Galatians chapter number six. Now we see just a direct application of this spiritual law from the physical application to the spiritual law. Look at Galatians chapter 6 and verse number 7. And it's interesting to note that Galatians chapter number 6, so a prerequisite to the sermon tonight is the Fruits of the Spirit sermon series that we've been working on for the last several weeks. And that is in Galatians chapter number what? Galatians chapter number 5. So one chapter over in Galatians chapter number 6 and verse number 7, it says, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And literally just a couple of verses before, he told you, hey, here's what you should be sowing. You shouldn't be sowing this stuff, but you should be sowing the fruits of the Spirit. All right? And then he tells you why in Galatians chapter 6 and verse number 7. But look, this applies. Notice what it says. Whatsoever a man soweth. It doesn't say whatsoever you, church of Galatia, soweth. It so says, whatsoever a man soweth, that, he shall, that shall he also reap. All men. This law applies to all men. And look, even the secular world knows this. Even the secular world knows this. Have you ever heard the, the phrase, what comes around goes around? Or how about this? This whole idea of this new age, whether it be Buddhism or whatever, this term karma, that's what they're talking about. They're talking about somebody, look, no, you didn't have to know the Bible to realize that things like, they, it just works this way. God is telling you why it works this way, and I'm going to explain to you how it works, because the Bible not only tells you that it does work this way, but God later on, I'm going to show you later in the sermon, he tells us how it actually works that way. He gives us the mechanics of the law itself. But the point is, Everybody knows this. Everybody recognizes this because it works this way across the board. It works this way across religions, across nationalities, whatever you want to say. You reap what you sow. And look, it works the same whether you sow good or whether you sow bad. So you reap what you sow, be it good or bad. Turn to 1 Kings chapter number 21. 1 Kings chapter number 21. So you reap what you sow. That's the first point. You reap what you sow. If you plant wheat, what do you get? You get wheat. If you plant soybeans, you get soybeans. If you sow garbage in your life, what do you get? You get garbage. If you sow strife, what do you get? You get strife. Look at verse, uh, 1 Kings chapter number 21. 1 Kings chapter number 21. So the first point is, you reap what you sow. If you sow good, you reap good. If you sow bad, you reap bad. If you just want to make two categories out of it. But the second point is this, and don't miss this. You reap more than what you sow. 
It's the same way in the physical world. It is the same way in the spiritual world. Now, look, that's either a great advantage or a great disadvantage. So don't you think you want to be on the right side of this law? Look at 1 Kings chapter number 21. This is why this concept in the Bible, this law, God telling us this in the Bible, God telling us that, you know, you're going to get what you sow. You're going to get exactly what you sow, and you're going to get more of it. It's so valuable. You have such an advantage as a Bible-believing Christian knowing this. Look at 1 Kings chapter number 21. Look at verse... I could show you examples all over the Bible about this, but I just picked one bad one and one good one. All right, look at verse number um, 20. Actually, let's go... This is, we got Ahab here and Elijah. Elijah is rebuking Ahab. Look at verse 21. So Elijah's going to rebuke Ahab because he stole, he stole um, Naboth the Jezreelites. He stole his field and he killed him. Remember his wicked wife Jezebel went and made this mock trial and they, they got this guy killed so, so Ahab could have his field. And Elijah goes to rebuke him. And look at verse 21. He says, Behold, I will bring evil upon thee and will take away thy posterity and will cut off from Ahab him that pisseth against the wall and him that is shut up and left in Israel. He's saying, you are going to be done. Your dynasty is going to be done. Your family is going to suffer for this, and it's just, I'm going to end you. But look at verse number 27. He's saying, your kingdom's going to be over. Verse 27, it says, it came to pass when Ahab heard those words, that he rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his flesh and fasted and lay in sackcloth and went softly. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Seest thou how Abel, Ahab humbled himself before me? Because he humbled himself before me, I'm letting him off the hook. Now look what God says. He says, I will not bring the evil in his days, but in his son's days will I bring the evil upon his house. So look, God just said, I'm just going to delay the action. The wind is not going to come around for a couple of decades, is all God said, because he humbled himself. But look, turn to Matthew chapter number 25. So the point is, you know, look, nobody's getting away with anything in, you know, this world. I mean, it may be more that people seem like they get away with things that are unsaved, but um, they will ultimately pay in eternity for that. Look at Matthew chapter number 25. So look, the point is, is that you reap what you sow and you reap more than what you sow. So in Ahab's case, he killed one person, but it's going to cost him his whole family, basically. It's going to cost him his entire, you know, you know, his entire dynasty of his kingdom. Look at Matthew 25 and verse number 24. Matthew 25, look at verse number 24. The Bible says, it's the parable of the talents. It says, then he which received the one talent came and said. So, of course, we had the guy with one talent, five talents, and ten talents. And the guy with one talent didn't do anything. He buried it in the ground, and he didn't know it was one talent. Was it two talents? Let me look back before I just say a bunch of things that are wrong. But the point is the guy with one talent didn't increase at all. He didn't increase any of his talents, and he gets rebuked by the master. All right? So in verse number 24, let me turn there, Matthew 25. Look at verse number 24. Matthew 25 and verse number 24. One second. So the guy with, two, you know, there was one talent, two talents, and then five talents, and then the guy with five talents um, doubled them. So the guy with one talent did nothing, and he just still had one talent. He made no profit. That's the point. All right? So verse number 24, he says, They that received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew that thou art an hard man. This is kind of a parable that I didn't really understand when I first read the Bible. Um, the first um, time I read through this, I'm like, it's kind of harsh. He was just trying to be safe with his master's talent here. He says, I, I know that thee are a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown and gathering where thou hast not strawed. That's an interesting point right there. Just keep that in mind. And I was afraid, and I went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou, ha Lo, there thou hast, that is thine. His Lord answered and said to him, Thou wicked and slothful servant. Now, I always thought like the first couple times I read this, like, man, that's kind of an overreaction. I mean, the guy, at least he kept it and was just safe. Thou knewest, but look at this. He says, Thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not and gather where I have not strawed. That is an explanation of how the law works. 
right there. Because the reaping and the sowing are done by different people, is what the Bible is telling us here. Look at verse 27. Thou oughtest therefore to put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I should have received my own with usury. Let me explain it a little better. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. So he says, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not. Meaning the sowing and the reaping happen at different places by different people. Okay, and that's an important point for us because we are not the ones that, you know, make the increase happen. That's what the Bible is trying to tell us here. Look at 1 Corinthians 3, verse number 7. 1 Corinthians 3, verse number 6, actually. The Bible says, I have planted, this is Paul saying, I have planted, Apollos watered, but look at this, God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. So that's how it works, folks. I mean, we sow what we sow, whether it be good or whether it be bad, and it is God that gives the increase of that sowing. It is God that gives that. And look, it's going to come back and we're going to, we're going to reap that. We're going, to, you know, we're going to receive that, but it's God that multiplies it and makes it to where we get more than what we sowed in the first place. And that's what the guy is telling, that's what the master is telling the servant in the parable of the talents in Matthew chapter number 25. So you reap the same thing that you sowed, and you reap more than you sowed. And God does this. God increases it in between there in the form of, let's say it was bad. Let's say I sowed bad things. Well, he increases it in the form of chastisement in the middle there. And that will come back upon me. And that's what we're talking about in Hosea chapter number 8. And they sowed all these bad things, and God is explaining what is coming back at them in the wind. That God has increased, and it, look, it's God doing that to them. It is God bringing that upon them. And look, if you sow good things, if you sow good things in your life, that will come back upon you. God will again give the increase, but that will come back upon you in rewards, in blessings from God. So good or bad, this law works the same. And that is super important to understand as Christians. So that's what we need to look at tonight and just look at ourselves as Christians, look at our lives and say, look, what are, go to Galatians chapter number five, go to Galatians chapter number five and just ask yourself, just looking at your life, at your Christian life tonight, what are you sowing in your life? I mean, what, what are, what is coming out of your Christian life? And this is the whole point of the fruits of the spirit Sermon series. Are you sowing, look, are you sowing, you know, love, joy, peace, long suffering? Are you sowing gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance? Are you sowing those things? Or are you sowing, you know, the works of the flesh? Are you sowing the adultery, the idolatry, witchcraft, variance, murders, hatred, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, the Bible says? Which of those lists of things describes you is the question that you should ask yourself this evening as you apply this law upon your life. Because that is what is going to come back on you. Remember, you reap what you sow. If you plant oranges, you get oranges back. If you sow the works of the flesh, you are going to get those things back. I mean, here's another, here's another uh, word for this. Uh, another secular you know, observation of this is the term poetic justice. If someone's ever said to you, like, well, that's poetic justice, where like, somebody like, got what they had coming to them in the same way they were doing to other people. You know, somebody that was, you know, somebody that was like a scammer and they were just, they were ripping people off for decades and they were just scamming people out of hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars, whatever it is. And then they lost everything by getting caught up in a scam. That's, that's poetic justice. But you know what that really is? It's that person just reaped what they sowed. It's just what the Bible is telling us. So look, which of those things, that's why I asked you 
on maybe not the last sermon on fruits of the Spirit, but the sermon before. Look, it's not like you're just going to look at these fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, and that's just going to be who you are all the time without any skips in the record. No, but it's, it's which of those lists of things describes you. Which of those things, if you would ask somebody else, not from your own vision, remember that? Remember that from the previous chapter in Hosea chapter number 7? Because many times, when you're in the works of the flesh, your vision is skewed. You can't see the truth of what you're actually doing. You could be in the works of the flesh. You could be completely self-willed, like Jeroboam was when he started this kingdom. And you could be completely in the works of the flesh, and you could think you're pretty great. The question is, how do other people see you? What are... You know, how does God see you? Which of these lists describes you? Because these things are going to come back upon you. Don't you think that this is important? Don't you think that you would want to know? Don't you think we should check ourselves? Like, do you want, I mean, read the list of the works of the flesh. Who wants that stuff coming back on them? Who wants that stuff magnified and hitting them a few years down the road? Here's what I think about. Here's what I think about. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter number 2. Here's what I think about. Here's my perspective. And when I talk about the perspective of a pastor, I want every single man in this room to think about themselves as the pastor of their home. I want you to think the same things that I am thinking. But I think about this. You turn to 2 Timothy chapter number 2. What are we sowing as a church? Because we as a church will reap what we sow. It works that way as well. I mean, of course, a direct, a direct application of this is just like soul winning. It's just like going out and knocking doors. Just like, you know, I mean, most people in the church at this point are just, or, you know, people that we've gotten organically out knocking doors. You know, so that's what we're seeing. We're seeing that organic growth from just going out and just preaching the gospel. And look, we're seeing it. We're seeing it work just with our feet shod with the gospel of peace, and we're just going out and we're just sowing God's word, and it's just coming back upon us. I mean, that, I always think of this also when we get like a visitor that got an inv invite like a year and a half ago. And we just had one of those the other night. Like, you know, we, she had been invited, you know, a year ago and then got another invite. And I'm like, oh, okay. You know, I'll come to church. But did you know that the church is more than just soul winning? You say, what do you mean? See, the soul winning, the soul winning in the church, that's the here and the now. That's what we're doing here and now. But, you know, the church is supposed to last for longer than two weeks, for longer than next week. There's supposed to be a plan where the church can, where the local church can keep sowing and reaping and keep going for, you know, forever. There's supposed to be this idea where this chain can just keep going forever and ever and ever. And the church can keep growing and bringing in more soul winners and just keep coming and families can keep coming. But the question is, yeah, the soul winning that we're reaping, that's that sowing that we're reaping, that's the here and now. But there's a, there's a bigger picture for the church. So the question is, what do we sow towards that bigger picture? That's what I think about. And look, does this matter? Does this matter? Turn to Ecclesiastes. I, I, I had you go to 2 Timothy, but go to Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Keep your place in 2 Timothy. What are we, like, what are we, what would people look at us? What would people look at us and see? People outside this church, when they look at this church and the people in it and what we're doing, what would they see? Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse number 1. The Bible says this. It says, a good name is better than precious ointment in the day of death than the day of one's birth. Talking about how important your reputation is. In Proverbs 22, the same thing is repeated. It says, a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches and loving favor rather than silver and gold. It sounds like it does matter. 
It sounds to me like it does matter. See, there's this spectrum of false doctrine that's out there. You know how much I like spectrums, but on the, on the far left of this spectrum is this thing called the prosperity gospel. And the prosperity gospel, now that you've heard Ecclesiastes 7 and Proverbs chapter 22, now you can flip back to 1 Timothy Go back to 1 Timothy 3. I kind of messed you up there. Sorry about that. But on one side of the spectrum is the prosperity gospel, that if, you, you know, if you're a Christian, that everything's going to be great and nothing will ever go wrong in your life. God's going to bless you and just you're going to have riches and everything's going to go better in business and all this kind of stuff. It's just, and look, there's a little bit of truth in that. On both of the false doctrine ends of this spectrum, there's a little bit of truth because the truth is somewhere in the middle. The prosperity gospel is going off the truth that, yeah, if you do get saved and start following the Bible and loving God and and getting things out of your life, that, yeah, you're going to start sowing good things and you get in the spirit and some of those things are going to come back upon you. God's going to bless you. That's true. But then there's the persecution side that they leave out of that. But then there's this other side of that spectrum that teaches, and it's false doctrine too, that teaches the more people that hate me, the more holy I am. And that is false doctrine. That is not true. Because if these verses in the Bible, you know, about a good name, about, you know, having a reputation, 1 Timothy 3, look down at verse number 7, talking about me, talking about the pastor. It says, moreover, after all the qualifications of a pastor, it says, moreover, he, the pastor, must have a good report of who, the church people? No, of them that are without So there's two ends. There's a prosperity gospel that's just all good news. And then there's this other side that, like, just just the more people that hate me, the more holy I am. And the truth is somewhere in the middle. The truth is somewhere. Look, the point is, is it does matter. Because what we sow, this will also be, talking about our sermon, this will also be what we reap. And for the pastor, it's saying that literally... Literally, people that are without, those are people that are not saved. Those are the 90% that I always talk about. Those are the people in the middle. And that matches with other Bible verses where it says, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Persuade who? Those that hate God? No. The 90%. The people in the middle. The people that we should have a good name with. The people that should have a... Those are the people that are without. Those are the people that you should have a good name report with. So look, it does matter what we sow as a church. You know, I've been, here's another thing I've been thinking about. Now you can go to 2 Timothy chapter number 2. What is a sermon? I mean, what, what is a sermon? What's the point? What's the point of a sermon? You know what a sermon is? A sermon is literally what I am sowing from the pulpit. It's sowing. Look at 2 Timothy chapter number 2. Now look, I could get in the flesh and I could just rip on everything that I am frustrated about at any given time. And look, let me tell you something. It, I'm not saying I'm perfect at not doing that. It feels good to do that. But it's self-willed if I would do that. If I would get up and I would just talk about all my personal problems and all the things that personally irritate me and all these different things, look, it would feel good for me to do that, but it would be self-willed preaching. The Bible tells me as a pastor how I should, in the pastoral epistles, 2 Timothy chapter number 2, look at verse 14, it tells me how I should preach and what I should preach. Look at verse 14. It says, Of these things, put them in remembrance. What things? Look at verse number 9. Go back a couple verses. But the word of God is not bound. Of these things, it's talking about the word of God. It says, of these things, put them in remembrance. It's talking about telling the people to remember things that are in the word of God. Charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. It says, Charging them. I'm supposed to preach. And that, that, that's your hard preaching right there. Charging you. 
no matter what, I've, okay, there's some people in the church that, you know, are, are into uh, sins and I come along that sin and I see things in the church that are popping up here and there and I need to preach on these doctrines and I'm charging you. And maybe you walk away from some sermons like, yeah, that was really good. And then you walk away from other sermons and be like, wow, that hit really hard because there's something going on that that touched in your life. But I am the one that is supposed to put you in remembrance of the things that are in God's word, not the things that I'm mad about or I'm upset about. Look at verse number 15. It says, study to show thyself approved. So now he's telling the pastor, he's like, hey, you should know what's in the Bible, though. You should know what's in the Bible because how are you going to how are you going to put people in remembrance of the word of God if you don't know what the word of God says? A workman that need not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You know what's a shame? You know what? You know what a workman that would be ashamed is somebody that just like just preaches a self-willed sermon and just grabs like half of Bible verses to just make the Bible seem like it agrees with their will. That's a shameful thing. Rightly dividing the word of truth. So the pastor should know the Bible, should preach the Bible, should not preach self-willed sermons and rightly interpret what the word of God says and bring it to these people for their remembrance. That's the idea. To the front of their mind, what they need to hear and then show them how to apply it in their lives. Look, I try very hard and again, I'm not claiming that I am perfect at this, but I try very hard to preach sermons that are sermons for you sitting here and not for views on YouTube. Amen. I try very hard to do that. A perfect example of this, a perfect example of this is the, the latest new doctrine of spousal discipline, a.k.a. wife beating. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I was, I was so upset over this new doctor. I wrote a sermon on it in about 12 minutes. It's the fastest sermon I've ever written. There's Bible everywhere. And then I realized, and look, I'm not against people that have preached on this, and I'm glad that you know, people have preached on it you know, to have that out there. But that would not be a sermon for this church. When I went through the statement that we made on that subject, I've never heard so many synchronous amens in the history of this church. There is no disagreement. There is no, there is no, um, there's no differing of opinion, even 1% on that topic. It's just not needed here. It would be, it would be an internet sermon. So I'm not going to preach it. So I preach on things like, this is why I preach on things like the family. This is why I preach on things like, you know, this is why I sow these types of things. That's why I preach on things like marriages, on not only having, you know, a marriage that lasts for your life, but having that great relationship in that marriage. Because the Bible tells us how we can do all those things. The Bible gives us concepts that we can apply to our marriage that will lead to that great relationship. And these are the things that I want to sow from the pulpit. And great marriages, great relationships between two Christian, uh, a husband, father, a Christian husband and a Christian wife, you know what they do? They raise happy, godly children. Amen. Applying sound doctrine. Turn to Jeremiah chapter number 29. Jeremiah chapter number 29. And going back to this concept of sowing, and reaping, look at Jeremiah chapter number 29. See, I want to preach these doctrines of the Bible that apply to you personally, in your personal life, in your personal family, with your children, because I don't want you to have any surprises when the reaping comes. Look at Jeremiah chapter number 29, and guess what? God doesn't want you to have any surprises either. Jeremiah 29, look at verse number 11. God says this, he says, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, that's the Bible, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. See, that's what it's all about. It's all about sowing these things. And then you can expect what's coming in the wind. And that's how God wants it to be. 
So that's, I don't want to preach sermons for someone in Alaska or whatever. I appreciate people that listen to the sermons online, but I preach things that matter for you. How the Bible applies to you. So we can all end up with the expected end that God wants us to have. And, and it's true. I mean, see, but you're, so you're asking, isn't it all about the kingdom of heaven? Isn't it all about soul winning? Yes, it is all about the kingdom of heaven. But it's about the kingdom of heaven for generations. Amen. See? Right. It's about people raising people to care about increasing the kingdom of heaven for not just your life, for not just 10 years, but for 100 years, for your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren. It's about loving husbands and reverent, virtuous wives, great relationships, children taught of the Lord, and then great shall be the peace of thy children. These are promises. These promises are the expected end that God is talking about. Look, this is the point that we must be sowing the right seed to the wind. Because if we are not, we are going to be surprised at what comes back. And that's why also it's not just, it's not just okay, the, the biblical family, and I'm going to have a sermon series coming up in the next couple weeks, uh, the Bible family, and that's all great. But you know what it is? It's also warning of sins. It's also warning of sins that will disrupt that. It's also preaching where God shows us to, to look for events in the world. Look for cultural shifts around you that there's no new thing under the sun. All of these things are documented here and warned about here. This is what needs to be preached. It's about dangerous, perverted ideologies that would ruin your children, that would ruin your marriage and your families. That's what a sermon is for. And if I, this is what I think about, if I sow that, if I can sow that, we will receive the expected end. Which is the promises written here in, right in front of you, in your lap. So, I mean, fathers, mothers, single people, what are you, what are you sowing? What are you sowing in your home? What are you sowing? Moms, what are you sowing at home? Are you sowing gentleness, goodness, faith? That's one of them. Are you sowing faith to those children? Or are you sowing strife? You need to think about what you are sowing tonight. If I went to work and I talked to your boss, what would he tell me that you're sowing? Would he say that you're sowing hard work, respectful talk, joy, long-suffering, temperance? Is that what your coworkers would say that you're sowing out in the world? Or are you sowing the same garbage as everybody else out there? Are you talking the same trash as everybody else right. out there? You have the same attitude as everybody else out there. Good or bad, you're going to reap it. And especially in your case, Christian, you're going to reap it. You're going to reap it here. And it's going to be a greater magnitude than what you sowed. In short, I mean, think about it this way. In short, you will bring yourself back upon yourself. <laughs> that's what this doctrine is. That's what this law that God is telling us about. So, I mean, who are you is the question tonight. Who are you? And look, what do you, let me rephrase. What are you known for? If I would ask somebody else about you, what would they say about you? And here's another one I've been thinking about. Would anyone want to be you? Would anyone ever ask you for a reason for the hope that is in you? If you're sowing nothing but 
envy, strife, adultery, perverted language. Would anyone want to be you? Would anyone want to be us as Christians? Who are we? Who are we as Christians? That, I mean, most importantly, look, who are we? What would people say about us? And does that match the expected end? Because look, when all this sowing is done, a lot of people, and that's the people in Hosea chapter 8, when all this sowing is done, a lot of people are going to be shocked at what that whirlwind contains when it starts coming back at them. It's what they sowed. And it doesn't matter that they thought they sowed something else. Because it's going to come back. It's going to come back upon us. But you know what? Not us. Not you. Not me. Let's get in the, the fruits of the Spirit. Let's make sure that we're edifying one another. Let's make sure that Hold Fast Baptist Church is is sowing good and beautiful things to the wind. Amen. And then, look, we, we will get that expected end. It's a promise. Amen. It's a promise. Pay attention to what we sow, because the whirlwind will, will show us if we were right. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.